Hello and welcome to Stats and Tactics episode number 17 this season. We've been doing this show for a long time, but in this form, it's now the 17th of this season. I normally look at uh, each Premier League game, uh, because I've not been well this week, I decided to do this on the Napoli game, which turns out it was just as good a game to do it on anyway. If you're new to the show, if you're watching it on YouTube, then the format of the show is this. We look at the stats from the last game. In this instance, that 1-0 victory over Napoli, we look at player stats, we look at team stats, we look at how Napoli have done, uh, we look at sofa score, we look at some Wii Scout stats, and we look at who scored as well. Then the second half of the show, I normally break it down and, and show you something maybe you might not know a little bit about. So in this instance, I've decided to pick packing and impact. Uh, it's something that I've done on the show before, uh, but because it is going out for the YouTube audience, I've decided to sort of do a sort of a refresher as well as looking at shot training quality or training shot quality, I should say. Um, so we're going to get into get into it. I'm going to start with sofa score. This is how the show normally starts. Uh, so we're looking at this website now, and you can look at each individual result. I've got it on the Liverpool one, Napoli nil result. And you can see here, uh, broken down, the Fletcher had less of the ball against Napoli, only 48% to 52%. But we dominated in key areas. So 22 total, sh total shots to eight, four shots on target to their three, 13 shots off target, not great from Liverpool, for five for Napoli. Five blocked shots, zero of Napoli's were blocked. We missed five big chances throughout that game. Napoli missed two. Um, we had three counter-attacks to their one. Opted to find counter-attacks are very difficult, actually. Uh, so they're normally quite low. We had 14 shots from inside the box to their six. Eight shots from outside the box to their two. It broken down, you can actually see first half, we had more of the ball, 53% to 47%, which means that second half, they had 40, we had 43% of the ball. So they have 57% of the ball. But what we were able to do as well, Napoli had more of the possession. We still dominated those shots. You can see second half, we had 15 shots to their five when we had less of the ball. It's something that Liverpool did very well in this game was actually second half surrender a little bit of possession for a directness when we had the ball, uh, which was very, very cool. Four of those big chances that we missed were actually in the second half as opposed to one in the first half. You can see that down there. Although we did concede two big chances, both of which thankfully were missed by Napoli. One of them, I'm sure you'll remember, was right at the end of the game. Um, so we're going to take a little look at the lineups now, and you can see Liverpool lined up in a in a four three three formation. Now, what's interesting if you're looking at this now, you'll see that each player has been given a mark out of ten. Now, this is based purely on statistics, uh, so it's not like a proper player ratings. If we were to do a player ratings, which are essentially the same, just giving people numbers for stuff. Um, I see that Virgil van Dijk actually doesn't do that well on this one, uh, but that's because he does pick up a yellow card and that'll go against him. If we look at him here, you can see his heat map there, it's exactly where you'd expect to see from Virgil van Dijk, and a little bit up top actually, um, obviously from corners and stuff. And He had seven clearances on the day, won three of four duels, only completed 34 passes at 85% accuracy, completed four of nine long balls, but it doesn't give you a full feel of how Virgil van Dijk performed on the day. And we'll look at quickly at Joel Matip just to see how he did. And you can see mirrors Virgil van Dijk in that heat map. Uh, three clearances for him, one interception, didn't make a tackle on the day, but won two of his three duels. 51 passes, so he was given the ball a lot more, completing exactly the same, 85%, completed six of 11 long balls. And then we can look at someone like Mo Salah, who is heat map... Actually did a little bit of defensive work against Napoli and had to do a little bit of defensive work. You can see that down here, but was still able to get into those dangerous areas of the pitch there, wasn't he? Uh, gets a goal, gets one shot on target, one shot off target, one shot blocked, three of six dribbles completed successfully, one big chance missed, only made 31 passes, completing 73% of them. Four key passes, though. From those 31 passes, brilliant. Created two big chances. Uh, won eight of 22 duels. That's ridiculously high. He was the highest on the pitch for Liverpool. Um, and won one of one tackles and comp uh, completed one interception as well. 
So what we do is on this, you can look at it actually broken down. So we'll go to the attack first to see who had the most shots on target. Well, Mane, Salah, Firmino and Jordan Henderson all had one shot on target. Wijnaldum had the most shots off target with three. Then it was Mane, two for Van Dijk, two for Henderson, two for Milner. Block shots, Bobby Firmino had two blocked. Then it was Trent, Salah and Wijnaldum all had one. Dribbles, most attempted was Salah, which we've talked about, completed three. Trent wins two of two. Robbo, two of two. Mane, two of two. Let's have a look at the notes. Ma uh, Salah missed one big chance. Sadio Mane, though, missed three big chances. And Virgil van Dijk actually missed the other big chance. I'm sure you remember that one as well. Defensively, the most clearances, Virgil van Dijk. In a small amount of time, Fabinho comes up second with three, then Matic with three, and then, as you'd expect, a couple there. Block shots, nobody. Interceptions, Trent had the most for Liverpool. Then Robbo, Salah, Firmino, Matip, Henderson, Wijnaldum and Milner all had one. Who won the most tackles? Sadio Mane wins three of three tackles. Milner wins three of five. Trent, one of four. Robbo, one of two. Mo and Firmino, one of one. Dribble pass the most, Trent Alexander-Arnold with three, Mane with two, Henderson with two. Passing-wise, uh, it was actually Joel Matip who completed the most passes for Liverpool, 51, uh, quite a high 85%. It wasn't the best passing game for Liverpool, but then I do feel like we played a lot more vertical passes this game, which are obviously a lot harder to complete. Lots less lateral and backward passes during this game. Um, Robertson, uh, next highest pass completion with 46, then Milner 44, Hendo 42, then Trent 34. Key passes though, it was 34 passes, Trent played six key passes, completed five of six crosses, which is absolutely superb for Trent, and completed three of five long balls. He also created one big chance. You can see Mo created two big chances and Andy Robertson, our other fullback, uh, created two big chances. So just our fullbacks alone created three big chances. Um, and then Milner, five key passes. Salah, four key passes. And Robbo, two key passes. Brilliant. Jules, as I told you, Mo Salah came out on top winning eight of 22. Sadio Mane wins seven of 19. James Milner, though, 11 of 17. He didn't quite contest the most, but he wins the most. And why now? Than four of 15 and there's lots of players high up the pitch contesting balls for Liverpool and importantly winning them back as well goalkeeper Alisson made three saves two saves from inside the box and we know how important the last one of those was so we'll go over to who scored now and we're actually looking at the match report and you can see here that Liverpool um attacked most down the right hand side 42 percent of our attacks actually came down the right hand side that's that's a 12 percent difference to the left hand side normally they're very very similar they alternate actually depending on the opposition their strengths and weaknesses as uh, when we look at this as the season goes on how liverpool attack most of the time i would say 60 40 it would be down the left hand side with andy robertson this time it was 42 percent down the right hand side and i wonder if that was because they were actually attacking 53 percent down the left hand side because they were forcing the ball down the left hand side well, we then try to get in behind with the likes of mo salah we'll come to that a little bit later on as well but teams quite often choose the right hand side to attack down i think they feel like trent alexander arnold is an easier person to attack than andy robertson and he's held up once again shot directions um, we tend to have most of our shots through the middle here, so 73% from the middle, and then an even split, 14% left, 14% right. Shot zones. I find this really important, and I'll explain this actually next. Um, this is about that training shot quality, and apologies for subscribers, we've been through this a few times, but for the YouTube audience, I think it's best that we sort of start again. So 64% of our shots were from inside the 18-yard box, broken down, that's 5% from the 6-yard box in the six yard box and 59% in the 18 yard box only 36% of our shots from outside the box Napoli did very well from this as well considering though that they had a lot less shots 70 6% of their shots were worked from inside the 18 yard box broken down 13 and 63 25% from outside now I'm going to use an article on Statsbomb. If any, and anybody knows Statsbomb, it's an incredible website. We can find out all different types of things about football analytics and uh, how you can measure things. One of this, I find this visually very appealing graphic that breaks down why I believe Liverpool do train shot quality. So, this is kick shots. 
uh, not assisted by crosses. And you can tell us statisticians wrote that, can't you? Kick shots not at assisted by crosses. Basically, if you're shooting from this area of the pitch, you will score about 80% plus of the time. Then here, 60 to 80. Here, 40 to 60. 15 to 20. Uh, 10 to 15. And out here, 5 to 10% chance of scoring. Now, let's take what we've just looked at there and apply that to Liverpool's shots. And you can see on who scored that most of Liverpool's shots are, in fact, from this good area of the field. And actually, if you break it down so that we can just see the inside the six-yard box ones, you can see there, that's where Mo Salah scores his goal from. It's inside the six-yard line. It's obviously going to be easier to score from inside the six-yard box than out here, for example, isn't it? So we break that down now, and you can see there just how many. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 maybe shots from inside the 18-yard box. All inside this almost fictional um, graphic that we've got here. Now, I'm going to just... Scroll down the article. It's a very good article. I would absolutely say to you to go and read it. Now, this is this is Lionel Messi's um, breakdown of shots from 2014-2015. Now, you can see here they've overlaid almost that graphic, and you can see where he scores his goals from, and you can see he has so many shots from inside this area. And what's really interesting is you might look at that and go, he's having loads of shots from outside the box as well. The difference with Lionel Messi here is, almost exclusively, these square ones are free kicks, you see. And now you look at it and go, he's actually not taking that many shots on from outside the area. Because I think of somebody like Phil Coutinho when he was at Liverpool, he takes so many shots from outside the area, not from free kicks. So Lionel Messi, the best player in the world, probably the greatest of all time, realises that he's better shooting inside the box because he's got a higher a higher chance of scoring. And if someone like Lionel Messi can do it, and I believe Barcelona have been doing this for years, trading shot quality, and Liverpool have been doing this, and we've seen this over the course of this season and last season on this Stats and Tactics show. When Liverpool play well, Liverpool create shots from inside those dan that danger area, inside the 18-yard box, right between the sticks as well. When we play well, that's where we score most of our goals from. Um, and as you can see there, Liverpool, most of them are give, give, give or take right between the sticks and inside that penalty area. Um, we're going to move on slightly now and we're going to look at another area of the pitch where Liverpool were particularly good against Napoli midweek. And that was losses of possession. Now, you might question why we're looking at losses of possession, but... Liverpool are the red ones here. Now you can see that this is Liverpool's half. We only lost the ball three times in our half. Trent Alexander-Arnold, unsuccessful touch. Mo Salah is tackled and loses possession. And Roberto Firmino there makes an unsuccessful touch. So three times, whereas you look at Napoli, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times they lost the ball in their half. Liverpool tend to lose the ball. And we've seen this throughout the season, higher up the pitch. And it's obviously better because it means we've got more men between us losing the ball and uh, losing possession. If we lose the ball, we're in a position whereby we've got more men uh, between us and the goal so we can defend it better. We'll take a look at some of the We Scout st stuff now. And this is something that we look at most weeks as well. Ball possession throughout the 15-minute segments, you can see 1 to 15, 16 to 30, 31 to 45, etc. We did really well with ball possession. We, we inserted our will on the game, 58% possession that first 15 minutes. Then it went up to 69% possession. We scored the goal and we dropped off a little bit. Napoli had to come out and get the ball back. So we actually conceded 63%, so our 37 there. Then we got control of the game uh, as the second half started and then Napoli had to come out and try and get a goal and we conceded a little bit of possession. Our passing accuracy started off well and got a little bit worse as the game went on. And I wonder if that is actually because if you look at the next graph, the long pass share, as our passing accuracy is taking a little bit of a nosedive, our long pass share is actually moving up. And this is us being a little bit more direct, trying to hit Napoli a little bit more on the counter-attack. And we were creating good opportunities during that phase of the game, if you watch it back as well. Uh, Jules' win rate, uh, Napoli did really well throughout the game, actually winning 41% uh, of the duels, Liverpool's 37 And you can see Napoli, generally speaking, much higher. But towards the end of the game, that's when Liverpool uh, got a little bit better at that. We were creating an attack every two minutes during the game. Napoli an attack every three minutes. And you can see there, that just before we scored, we were, we were creating sort of... 
uh, what's that, about one and a half attacks every two minutes at this point here, so that's really good. And then there, and then at the end, we were still doing better. We recovered the ball much better than Napoli as well. You can see our red line much better than them. Average formation line, we started with quite a low back four. And this is 48 metres, so just on the halfway line. But towards the end of it, we pushed that line up a little bit. And the PPDA is the pressing intensity, so it uh, passes per defensive action. They've pulled much better. So Napoli were only able to have 5.8 passes before we produced a defensive action in that first 15 minutes. And we kept that going along. You can see that's really good. Whereas Napoli, you know, 50 passes Liverpool strung together in that 15 minute segment before half time, um, before they were able to do anything in a defensive sense. And that's something that Liverpool have, have kept high all season long. Or low all season long I should say and then finally the XG dynamics you know there's different F XG models in this particular instance Liverpool's XG for the game was 2.33 at uh, Napoli's 0.9 and those players you know Sadio Mane had an XG of 1.05 isn't able to get a goal on the day um, feel free to pause the video have a little look at that digest that in your own time um, I'm going to move on now to pass combinations is something that I like to look at and particularly, I don't know whether you guys on YouTube will have heard me mention this uh, over the course of the last few weeks, is how I think that when you play a 4-3-3 formation, I think the Trent Alexander-Arnold actually improves. And one of the reasons that I think he improves is when we play this 4-3-3 formation, generally speaking, Mo Salah's the guy ahead of him and not playing in that number nine role. And I think midweek against Napoli, Salah was back on that right-hand side. And what that does for me is it gives Trent when he's under pressure and out ball. And you know, Mo Salah's always running in behind, isn't he? And Trent can just whip that ball in because he's got such a great pass. And I've said it so many times over the last few weeks, and it's evidenced here. I mean, he makes 13 passes. The biggest pass combination from any player on the pitch is our right back, Trent Alexander Arnold, to one of our forwards in Mo Salah. And he plays that pass 13 times into Mo Salah's feet there. Or oh, ahead of him. Um, and that's something that I feel like Trent is so much better better for and better utilised to do is when he's got Salah to run into that space behind him, kind of like Leicester did when, when they won the league title with, was it all Brighton in the centre or no it wasn't all Brighton, it was the other guy, I forget his name now, uh, hitting that ball over the top to Jamie Vardy, that's what I feel like Trent's superb at and you can see Andy Robertson as well, nine passes into Virgil van Dijk, 11 passes into James Milner, he's good at moving the ball, so we utilise both of our fullbacks to move the ball forwards, one to James Milner and one to Mo Salah. And then it obviously gets a little bit more difficult. But Mo Salah, eight times he actually fed the ball into uh, Genie Wijnaldum. So he's able to play, but nine times he fed the ball back to Trent Alexander-Arnold. And again, have a look at this. And you can see patterns emerge of how Liverpool like to move the ball forward and how we move the ball back as well. Um, but the main part of this show, I suppose, is going to be unpacking. But before we get into that, I just want to show you the pass map from 11, Tegan 11, uh, and between the posts. I've been looking at these now for maybe two or three years. And, and this is a quite a different one for Liverpool, actually. I think the back four is how you would expect. The average positions of the players are where they are. Trent quite high, Robertson high, Henderson in the middle there. And now these lines are only for passes, uh, combinations made five times or more. So you can see Henderson to Firmino, there is no line because he didn't play that ball five times into Roberto Firmino. What, what we're able to do here and why this pass map looks different to most of the pass maps Liverpool have is Mano and Wijnaldum played a lot higher up the pitch and Firmino and Mane were almost, you know, on Milner and Wijnaldum's toes, but what we were able to do is find those little bits of space, and Salah's where he always is, whether he plays the nine or he plays on that right-hand side, he always tends to be the furthest player forward and always slightly off to that right-hand side. And you can see exactly what I'm saying here. You know, Becker plays the ball to Matip a lot. Matip plays the ball to Trent. And Trent plays the ball to Salah there. And that's something that you can see. Again, Robertson to Mane, Mil uh, Robertson to Milner, Milner back to Robertson. And then these arrows, the Nate movement. So for me, there's lots of side to side movement. Mane, lots of side to side. Henderson, side to side. Milner, front and back. And Robertson, front movement. And again, it's something that we look at quite a lot. Now, I, I did say that the, the main bulk of this show was actually to look at packing and impact. And that's right, and I think, you know, to be able to do that, I wanted to put just a short tutorial together to show you exactly what both of those terms mean. 
Okay, so this is just a short explanation video to explain packing and impact. Um, so we'll start off with, let's say Joel Matip has the ball here, the yellow mark has the ball. He plays a pass to Trent Alexander-Arnold. Is that path, pass worth as much as a ball, let's say, to Roberto Firmino's feet here? Well, in this instance, it isn't. Um, you might get one pass completion in normal football stats for it, but it's clearly not as good as getting the ball to Roberto Firmino. And what packing does is it assigns values to the pass that you have played. So, for example, Joel Matip plays this ball out to Trent Alexander-Arnold. He doesn't take any players out of the game. These strikers are still behind the ball between them and the goal down here. So he doesn't get any packing stats for that. If he was to play the ball to GDY Wijnaldum, he might get a packing rate of two because he's taken Mertens and Insigne out the game and now Wijnaldum's able to move the ball forward. If Wijnaldum then moves the ball forward to Roberto Firmino, he then bypasses another one, two, three, four players. So his packing rate would be four. That simple. Now, if Roberto Firmino plays a slide rule through ball in here and, t and Mo Salah ends up on the ball and he takes the keeper out as well, then he would get one, two, three, four, five packing rate. Now, there are different variations of how you can measure packing and that is where impact comes in. Now, impact assigns a value to each type of player on the football field. So, for example, let's bring it back again. Joel Matip plays that ball in to Genie Wijnaldum here. Now, the packing rate, the players packed, would be two. Now, let's take the ball to Mo Salah, and he plays the ball to Roberto Firmino. And let's say those fullbacks are out the way anyway. So we've just got two players, exactly the same model as down there. Mo Salah plays the ball into Roberto Firmino. Is that pass as valuable by taking two players out, as this pass by Joel Matip to Genie Wijnaldum, because he takes two players out as well. Well, impact says it isn't, and it assigns values based on the positions of the field that these players are. So Matip might take two players out, but they're only strikers. What impact does is it says, well, I'll tell you what, you've taken two players out, but they're the last two players defending the goal. That pass is much more significant in terms of build up to trying to score a goal than the pass from Joel Matip into Genie Wijnaldum's feet there. And that's where impact comes in. Now there are different models for impact. Some models might say, okay, there is a rate that goes with the back defensive six players. So a spinner through to Hamsik here. And there is a different rate for bypassing these players here. And there are some models that would say, you times it by three, for a defender or a goalkeeper, or your times it by two for a midfielder, or your times it by one for a striker. So let's just explain that a little bit slower. Matip then plays that ball to Genie Wijnaldum. He takes two players out the game. His packing rate is times by one for each of those players. So it's just your two. Salah takes out two players to Roberto Firmino. Now they're defenders, so their times might be three. So he might get a packing rate of three plus three is six. So therefore that is much, uh, an impact rate sorry, of six, which is much better than the impact rate of two, even though you are only bypassing the two players. So what this is good for in football is actually analyzing how good a team is at taking opposition players out of the game with a pass. Matip to Firmino there, bang, we see it so often. Well, he takes out one, two, three, four, five, six players with one pass. That's what Joel Matip's good at. That's what Joe Gomez is good at. That's what Van Dijk's good at. Robertson, Alexander-Arnold. It's why we're so much better, I believe, this season than last season, because we're getting the ball into strikers' feet taking players out of the game, ensuring that they can't get back in, and then we move on. Think about that goal against Bournemouth. We'll look at that later on in the video. Matip plays the ball into Firmino, takes out the midfield, takes out the attack. Two passes later, ball's in the back of the net. So hopefully that's explained it to you. Yeah, I just want to highlight an article from AnfieldIndex.com. Um, friends of the show, obviously, great podcast. Uh, some great written content on there as well. And, th and this is by a guy on Twitter called uh, Distance Covered, and his name's Josh Williams. And it's a 
fantastic article actually. It breaks down quite a lot of this season's Liverpool stuff. Now it's a little bit out of date now uh, because the season's moved on since it was written, but the article itself is absolutely fantastic. And I've spoken to both Gags at Anfield Index and Josh on Twitter and made sure that they're okay with me using it, which is cool, which is thank you to them first and foremost. Uh, and just to say that I really, really enjoyed the article. Um, I remember reading it when it first came out. Um, but this explains packing in a, in a very, very good way. And it explains why it's so important. And it also explains why Liverpool are so good at it. I won't read the whole thing. I have explained packing already to you. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to scroll down to the bottom. Please go and read this on Anfield Index. Give Distance Cover the follow on Twitter as well. He's absolutely fantastic. And I am just going to take you down to some of the, the, the player stats. And I think James Milner's highlighted here is is absolutely outstanding. Um, let's let's have a little read through this part of the article. So first, we'll start with James Milner, who, according to the data, is the best in the league relative to his position at the time of writing. By the way, Milner bypasses opponents fifty opponents per match based on the figures so far this season, which is likely done through passing or pressure and regains because he's certainly not the type of player to make advances through dribbling. His crossing game is less prominent since moving away from the left back position. Milner's average is better than ninety three percent of players in his position. Eight point six of those. Are 50 opponents bypass per match of defenders, which is better than 91% of the league. So this shows that in addition to progressing the ball when building deeper, Milner is also equally as productive when it comes to penetrative passes in decisive areas. Defensively, Milner is outstanding as he prevents opposing players bypassing him on average 12.1 times per match, the best figure for all midfielders in the league. By combining his progressive play with his proactive defending, Milner is currently ranked as the number one midfielder in the Premier League in reference to packing, further emphasising his strong start to the campaign. And you can see here, just on this graphic alone, he's very highly ranked in bypassed defenders, bypassed opponents, bypassed opponents in receiving. So that's not only, it's not always about playing the pass, it's also about getting yourself into a position where you can receive the ball and, you know, those players can be packed, as it were. And he's allowing chances and his ratio of interceptions as well suffered uh, bypassed. Really cool there. Why now them? Not so good with moving the ball forward in his bypassing the defenders or bypassing opponents. Uh, but you can see receiving the ball, he's always getting into a good position and he's, a, he's very, very good at prevented, uh, be, preventing being bypassed as well. And you can see there that slightly different to James Milner's. He's a bit more of an all-rounder, isn't he? but very good in a key area. And then finally, Jordan Henderson, actually good at bypassing defenders, bypassing opponents, not quite as good as James Milner. Not quite as good at receiving the ball, which I think, you know, is completely fair, but he's good at not being bypassed as well. Uh, and then Andy Robertson, who's bypassing defenders, opponents, good for receiving the ball and prevents being bypassed. So these are all reasons these Liverpool players all rank, rank very highly in packing and impact stats because not only are they good at playing the ball through the defenders, but they're also good at getting into positions and stopping the ball going in behind them, importantly. Um, so what we'll do is we'll actually move on to a graphic from Impact themselves on Twitter. Um, and, you know, this is one of theirs. That, this was done after 12 games of the Premier League. And you can see here um, that it's actually ranked on bypass defenders and then the defensive side of that um, suffered bypass defenders and net. And you can see after 12 games, Manchester City were top after 12 games, weren't they? And they had a net of 25. We were bypassing, they were bypassing 56 defenders and only being bypassed 31 times. Liverpool bypassed 53 defenders uh, and suffered 33, net 20. And then it was Chelsea. Wolves were really high in this as well. Then Arsenal, Bournemouth, Tottenham. And you can see lowly, lowly Manchester United are actually really poor in this. And I think that's quite interesting, isn't it? I'd love to see this graphic up to date in the Premier League um, now because I wonder whether Manchester City would still be top at this or whether Liverpool would be top. But this is one of those stats for me whereby you can look at possession and shots and all that. And we've already looked at that at the start of this show, but you can still not guess who's won the game sometimes from that. And I think what you can do is when you look at packing stats, I think it gives you a better idea of who's going to win that game of football. Of course, things still happen in football. That Dortmund-Liverpool game, the 4-3 from a few years ago, I'm sure 
the packing stats would say that Dortmund deserved to win that game. Football, mad things happen sometimes, but it's much better for me than some of the things that we'll look at. And I'll show you that right now. Okay, so as an example of this one now, possession, 47% to 53%. Shot 18, shots to 14. Shots on target, 8 to 10. Corners, 7 to 5. Where do you think we're going with this? Who do you think won this game? Was it a close game? Was it not a close game? I mean, this is highlighted quite often. Now, if I was to tell you that this is the game when Germany beat Brazil by seven goals to one, looking at that, would you have known who, who was who? Um, would you have guessed that there'd be a six-goal swing between those sides, looking at those stats? And this is why I suppose the impact is, is so important and why some people think it's really, really important. Because these stats don't really tell you the story of the game. Obviously, it's difficult when you don't see the score. But what we can see is actually when you scroll down a little bit, and I'll go on to this one now, Germany had a much better packing rate, 402 to 341, and an impact rate of 84 to 53. Now, it shows you that Germany took out 61 more players than Brazil. That's a 15% swing in favour of the Germans. The impact numbers are, are more conclusive, it says here. Germany was much better in beating defenders than Brazil. You know, 31 defenders beaten more. And that's why, you know, when you take everything together, you get a better, more well-rounded picture. And it's something that I believe that Liverpool are very good at nowadays. And you can see that by James Milner. I think Joel Matip's really good at it. And that's what we're going to show you next is actually going to show you some stills from the game where Joel Matip is taking players out with his passion. And why I think Joel Matip could be a really big miss for us. Although he's only played a couple of games back to back. My Joe Gomez and, and, and Joel Matip are very good at what they do because they able, they're they able to enable us to play through teams without working too hard. Right, so this is four of these are from the Napoli game and then one from the Bournemouth game at the weekend. And to be honest, there were six I could have taken from the Napoli game. Um, so these are just still images taken from the game. And you can see in this first one, Joel Matip's got the ball there. And who he's going to try and play the ball to actually hasn't... He's not in the picture yet. And you can see this now. As Joel Matip plays this pass in to Bobby Firmino's feet and Bobby tries to knock the ball around the corner to Mo Salah and what Joel Matip is able to do in this instance is actually if we just go back slightly he takes out one, two, three, four, five players so we'll just roll this on to the next still now and then you can see when the ball's been played you can see one, two, three, four, five players all taken out of the game by Joel. And then he moves the ball on. It's unfortunate because it's not the best pass and Koulibaly does well, actually. Um, but it is it is exactly what we're looking for out of Joel Matter because we could play that a safe ball there to Trent Alexander-Arnold and Trent might have a difficult ball into Wijnaldum. But if Joel Matter can do it and take five players out the game, then we're just much closer to their goal with less players between us and their goal, isn't it? Um, so that's a, that's a good example of it. Uh, the next example we've got uh, is very, very similar, actually. And you can see Joel picks the ball up here and he starts to stride forward with the ball, actually. And there's one, two, three, four, five, six players there in shot that you can see. And as he picks the ball up, he decides to stride out with it. And just as the guy's about to come in and tackle him. He plays a pass there, and it's a quite a safe pass, to be fair, to Trent Alexander-Arnold, but he's still, packing-wise, one, two, three, four, five, questionably six he takes out. And then Trent, very quickly and easily, then moves the ball on himself. And what Trent does is a couple of these lads have got back in. Trent knocks the ball straight over the top and takes another five players out. So in those two passes, you can see we bypass their attack in the midfield, and then all of a sudden we're bypassing the midfield and their defence. And that's two quick, good, penetrative passes from Liverpool centre-half and right back. And then you can see in this example, Joel's picked the ball up there on the edge of our area. By the time he plays the pass, it's straight into Mo Salah's feet. And one, two, three, four, five players again. He could play the simple ball into Gini Wijnaldum. We could try and play the simple ball into Jordan Henderson. But he doesn't. He plays a great ball into Sal Salah's feet. He then turns the corner and has a run on his man. 
and it's absolutely superb again from Joel Matip. Plays an incredibly difficult pass, and then Mo Salah's away, and he's just packed one player there with one touch straight round him, and he's running a cooler barley then down the right hand side. And it, again, one pass, defence to attack, player taken out, players taken out all over the field, and it's something that Joel Matip's very good at. Here's another example again during the Napoli game, 66th minute. He's got the ball there, strides forwards. And then who's he going to hit? He's not going to play a simple ball to Trent Alexander-Arnold. He could play a simple ball into Jordan Henderson if he wants. But he plays this ball into Genie Wijnaldum, who's found himself in a fantastic area of the field. And he's taken out this time one, two, three, four, five. And by the time that ball gets to him, he takes out a sixth. And what Genie's able to do, actually, is very, very quickly just turn that ball around the corner for James Milner. Now, that would have been a great pass as well, because he'd have taken out one, two, three, four players, and Milner would have been running in. The problem we had this time is that James Milner was offside, but again, two passes, front to back, through their entire team, great packing stats, or a, pack, a great packing rate for both of those, or all of those players, pretty much. Like. And then finally, the Bournemouth one here. You can see this one, uh, he picks the ball up, you can see that you can you can't see all their players, but you know, judging by where this midfield are and these two strikers, that they're in a four four two. Very difficult to break down a four four two. Everyone tells you that for years and years. And what Joel's able to do is he just plays the ball calmly into Roberto Firmino's feet, taking out six players, playing through their entire midfield, and then we know, you know, just a pass or two later, Firmino's having a little one two with Mo Salah. Mo Salah plays the ball back to Roberto Firmino. Their midfield still on in the game. Re Roberto Firmino takes his shot. The goalkeeper spills it. And that's it. The ball's in the back of the net. All because Joel Matip was able to play a brave pass to the centre forward and take out not only their attack, but their entire midfield with one pass. And that's why I love uh, impact and packing in football. You know, it, again, I love the stats side of football. That's why I do this show every single week. And I hope you, you do too. Um, but this is the type of stuff that we're looking at on the website every single week. How Liverpool are improving, why they're doing the things that they're doing. Trying to just understand Jürgen Klopp and his methods. And it's a journey, you know. I have such great conversations with, with our subscribers on the website who are interested as well as I am in all this type of stuff. Don't get me wrong, I love the opinions of football and I love the the, the emotion of football as well, but I, I like it all, man. I like the stats side of things. I like trying to understand what Jürgen's doing. I feel a little bit more empowered as a fan, knowing uh, that we can we can delve deep into these issues and, and into these things at the football club. I just think it gives us a better knowledge. If you've liked the video, then please uh, do subscribe to the Red Men TV on on the website, uh, we do these every single week. If you like this in particular video, cool, like the video, subscribe to Red Men TV on YouTube. Leave us your thoughts as well. Is this the type of stuff that you want to see us do a little bit more of on the YouTube channel? Um, leave them in the comments section below. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Ta.